Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar for grades through third through fifth grade in our 2021-2022 webinar series focused on building student visual literacy skills. I'm Rebecca Edwards. I'll be your host today. I'll be presenting together with my colleague in the Getty Museum Education Department, Darcy Beeman Black. Today, we'll be focusing on strategies that you can use in the upper elementary school classroom for researching art. We'll share how these approaches integrate with the Common Core Standards and talk about how you can use them to guide students in doing some detective work. We also hope to inspire you to incorporate works of art into your teaching across subject areas. For our examples today, we've used works of art in the Getty Museum's collection, but our goal is for you to be able to apply these same concepts to all different kinds of images that span well beyond the Getty's collection. So let's start by talking about why talk about researching art in your classroom. So for those of you who have been with us for the earlier part of the uh, academic year, you may already be aware that this is the third in a series, the first of which we talked about how to read an image. The second webinar, we talked about how to talk about art, how to use dialogue and discussion in your classroom when it comes to works of art. In this webinar, we're focusing on how to research art. Our hope is that these pieces, when you put them all together, give you a range of strategies that you can use to build student visual literacy skills. We are putting all of the webinars up on the Getty's YouTube channel. So if you missed any and would like to revisit them, um, please stay tuned and you'll um, be able to find them all online. We already have the webinars for how to read an image online. We're about to upload the how to talk about, about art webinar videos and we'll be following in the, at the end of February with this webinar video. So for those of you who have been to those previous webinars, um, I'd like to share uh, and remind you of our how to read an image infographic. This, we find this is a useful tool for thinking through all the elements of art that you might consider in, in guiding your students through the process of looking at them, analyzing them, and formulating their thinking about them. Researching a work of art factors into this process, especially for the analyze and synthesize steps. So it can supplement the work that you're already doing from close looking and dialogue. So it's easy to connect what we'll be talking about today to the Common Core Standards. Um, we pulled here the writing standards. These are standards number seven, eight, and nine. And this is for the state of California. Um, which outlines different research-based uh, skills that students are building during grades three through five. Everything that we'll be talking about today aligns with these standards. So when we were developing the content for this webinar, we had a couple of guiding considerations that we wanted to make transparent. So one, is that we were focusing on sharing resources for research that are widely accessible. So as museum employees, we have a lot of access to files that contain information about works of art, but which aren't readily available to the general public. Our goal was to not look at those and to share with you what we thought you would be able to find on your own. Similarly, uh, we've focused on examples using works of art from the Getty's collection but we have used, we've used them to illustrate approaches that you can use with all different kinds of images. Additionally, we've focused on selecting images that we think will intrigue children in grades three through five. The process of incorporating art into your classroom shouldn't feel like pulling teeth, it should feel fun. The last thing to mention is we focused on digital strategies rather than book-based strategies to take into account the limited access to physical resources during COVID and also the fact that many students have an easier time accessing material online. We've also 
uh, tested most of the websites that we'll be sharing on a school district laptop to make sure that the firewall, at least for one school district, allows access to them. So we've chosen to focus on four lenses for reaching, researching a work of art. The purpose of having these lenses is to give you a way to can curate your efforts and to guide your students. As we go through this, you'll start to see that many of these lenses can overlap. A single work of art can be researched using a variety of lenses. And you'll notice that for some of the examples that we're sharing, there's overlap between the lenses. Um, that said, we find that these lenses provide a really good entry point for thinking about what to focus on when you research a work of art. So we'll be looking at four lenses. One is the artist's point of view. One is the cultural and historical context of the work of art. The third is the making process. And the fourth is the documentary lens. So we'll be getting started with um, discussing the artist's point of view as a lens for researching a work of art. And with that, I'm gonna hand over the presentation to my colleague, Darcy Beeman Black. Hello, everyone. So let me get the slide up for us. So like Rebecca said, the first lens we will use to resource to research a work of art from our collection is all about exploring the intentions, the experiences, and the perspectives of the artist. So we think research, researching a work of art with the point of view of the artist in mind helps us to think about the artist, but also find out more about the people in the work and the creation of the work that you may not have thought of otherwise. So through this exploration, we can also practice empathy with students. So when using the artist's point of view to research a work of art, there are several questions that we may consider asking to find out more about what that work of art is about. So we can not only ask the who, what, why to get started, but we can also consider how the artist's perspective, perspectives are impacted by the time, place, and culture it was made. We can also compare the work with other works made by the same artist or other contemporaries of the time, um, and as well as other depictions of the same subject. So I'm gonna go through the process of finding the answers to many of these questions uh, with all of you um, moving through a few steps using familiar strategies that you're more than likely already using with your students. So let's say we don't know anything about this piece. A good place to start is to look at basic information about that object. For example, a gallery label has a lot of information that we can gather. However, with more information, you probably will come up with more questions. <laughs> to begin the research process, maybe you could have students generate a list of questions that they have when they're looking at the label. Questions like, who is Miss Lala? Is this her? What is this person doing? What is the Fernando Circus? And who even is Edgar Degas anyway? And where is he from? So once you generate a list of questions, it's time to start finding those answers. So you could highlight some search terms that you have in your questions. Um, the search terms that we're gonna focus on um, are Miss Lala, Fernando Circus, and Edgar Degas. So as it turns out, uh, the Getty has this piece from our collection included in the Google Arts and Culture website. From this information, we find out that Edgar Degas was an artist who was really taken by the modern city and the entertainment scene at the time and spent a lot of time in places like the opera house, the racetrack, and the circus. So we also find out when we look at Fernando Circus that it was in Paris near where Degas lived and it was a hot spot for progressive art at the time. 
uh, Degas would go to the circus night after night to sketch Miss Lala. He was reportedly so captivated by her performance that he drew a series of life drawings that um, culminated into an oil painting that was exhibited in a major show along with other popular artists of the time. And then we also find out who Miss Lala was. Uh, she was a famous biracial aerialist who toured France and England under a variety of stage names like the Venus of the Tropics or the African Princess. She purposely used these names to appeal to European notions of exotic beauty at the time. Her performances included a variety of feats of strength and agility, including being hoisted high up in the air by means of a pulley, a rope, and a specifically fitted dental device. And that's what Degas depicted in his sketches of her. And uh, he would sketch every night he saw her perform. So one thing I wanna point out, I just gave you sort of the synopsis of what we're looking at here, um, but I did spend some time uh, clicking on hyperlinks as I was curious about words. And I think that that's a really good feature of Google Arts and Culture. Um, and it can be very helpful to students who are maybe looking at vocabulary that they don't know. Uh, so after learning more about what inspired Degas, uh, I wanted to look up Miss Lala on another source, and I found a photograph of her on Wikipedia. There's also more information about who she was and like who this woman was who just so greatly inspired Degas. Um, so now that we found basic information about the work of art, I think maybe we can just dig a little deeper because this was just sort of the surface. So I want to revisit some of the questions that we were considering earlier. So how does the artist's point of view connect with time, place, or culture it was made? So as I mentioned earlier, what is so great about Google Arts and Culture is that not only does it tell me many of the answers that I'm looking for, or the general answers, but it also has those hyperlinks that I can click on, like I mentioned. Um, and that can really give me um, a better idea of the time and place. So when I started contextualizing those and clicking around, for example, I learned that France was expanding their colonial empire at the time to Asia and Africa. So there was also this exoticization of the other for consumption going on at this time. All this new information made me think about Miss Lala and how the intersection, intersectionality of her success as a famous biracial performer and the French government colonizing Africa may have impacted her experience at the time. I also thought about what role Degas played in this dynamic. So depending on your students, they may not react to this new information in the exact same way um, they may not know the word like intersectionality or, you know, they may not think about what colonizing Africa really looks like, but they may or may not, they will react to this information in different ways, just as I did. Um, and they will contextualize the time and place um, if they continue to explore. And they will formulate opinions and hopefully come up with more questions. So one way to further contextualize that, uh, this work is to compare it with another work of art depicting the same subject. So I found this show poster featuring Miss Lala in a different style. So this made me think about how Degas depicted her in comparison. And the show poster depicts a very cartoon-like caricature of Miss Lala, while Degas depicted her very differently. So Degas made choices that captured Miss Lala in a very real life way. So one choice is the point of view and the viewer's perspective of her in the air, you know, while she's doing her thing. Degas captures her um, in this way and perhaps shares her with us as someone that he admired. 
She has an interesting pose, which was challenging for the performer, I'm sure. I mean, she's hanging from her teeth with no hands. And for, and it may have also been difficult for Degas to draw. I imagine that he must have enjoyed drawing her night after night to figure out the best way to capture the experience of watching her. So another good source that I wanted, a source of information that I wanted to share um, is actually on the Getty Museum's YouTube channel. And many museums do have YouTube channels where they feature uh, different works of art and Getty curators will put them together. Um, Getty curators made this video about that work of art by Degas specifically, and I'm not going to play it, but it sums up all the information that we found. Um, and then it also sort of brings to life this journey of Degas and, and the relationship that he had with Miss Lala. Um, it's only about two minutes long, and it really does a good job of bringing text to life um, that we found on our searches. And finally, um, before we move on to the next lens, I did want to share a few more works of art from our collection that connect to curriculum and perhaps have interesting aspects to research through the artist's point of view lens. The self-portrait with Newsboy, which if you've been to our previous webinars, you will recognize. Uh, and it captures the experience of the photographer taking this image of a young newsboy in a different time and place. And students can use this same research approach we just did to uncover even more information about the work of art. And I love it because you can even see the artist in this one. So another piece you could research with your students is a photograph of the eclipse dance to uncover how the choices of an artist to depict a subject in a specific way can lead to various discoveries and takeaways. So with that, I'm going to now pass it back to Rebecca, who's going to share another lens. Thanks, Darcy. So um, Darcy shared this image of Edward Curtis's photograph that's been ad hoc titled The Eclipse Dance um, as an example of an image that you could research from the artist's point of view. But I also wanted to show how you could look at this image and study it using a cultural and a historical lens. So. So when you're thinking about an object or a work of art from a cultural and historical context, here are some guiding questions that can help you explore that work. Not every question will apply to every work of art, but we found that it's helpful to have some umbrella questions to help guide the thought process when you're researching something. So we'll explore not all of, but several of these questions with this work of art. So we, we start here with what does the image represent? And it's not exactly clear. It takes some wondering. Some people will notice figures. They'll notice that they're holding things. They'll see a sense of movement. But other than the title, it's hard to know off the bat exactly what you're looking at. So I started with questions like who's pictured? What are they doing? Where was this photo taken? And it also seems important to consider multiple points of view because we have the photographer and we also have the subject. The other thing that came up when I started my research of this is that sometimes when you search terms related to the work of art, you find um, websites or Google gives you responses that are not relevant. I actually found that that's a learning opportunity too, to think about why is it giving me that result and why does it not make sense in this, this context? So I think it's okay, don't be afraid to have students find the wrong answer too. And then to use that as an opportunity to talk about why it's not the right answer. So I started by pulling up the work of art in Google Arts and Culture. As Darcy has shared, Google Arts and Culture is a great place to get started when you're just trying to get some baseline information about a work of art. 
And by looking at this page, I found several key terms that I'm then going to go ahead and use to search for more information about what this photograph depicts. So from Google Arts and Culture, I was able to find that this depicts a Native American tribe that resided in the Pacific Northwest, that they were called the Kwakiutl, um, that what they're doing, that action that looks like movement is dancing. And I also found the, the period during which this was taken to give me a sense that it's not that old, but it's also not really contemporary. I'm also pulling up a page from the Getty Museum's website where you can find all of the same information. Just wanted to give you a sense of the fact that there are different places you can look to find this information. So with these search terms that I found to start with, I started doing searches to find out more. And in looking into the Kwakiutl, I thought it was useful to consider multiple sources. So the first thing that came up for me was the Brit Britannica's website, and they had a short entry that told me a little bit more about where in the Pacific Northwest the Kwakiutl live, which was near Vancouver, uh, kind of on the coast of Vancouver Island. Um, it also talked a little bit about language and history of the Kwakiutl people. And it talked a little bit about dance, but didn't give me the information I was looking for. I also found a website called Tribalpedia. And what was notable to me about the Tribalpedia website was the voice is different. Instead of a outside source talking about the Kwakiutl, this website pulls from Kwakiutl's telling their own story. And I thought it was interesting to con compare the way that different sources talk about the Kwakiutl. So for example, you'll note that in this web page, there's discussion of the ancestral heritage of the Kwakiutl, whereas the Britannica website didn't focus as much on that. I think it's an interesting discussion to have with your students about different voices and different ways of looking at a subject and how the person who's who's creating the information for you changes what you hear and the perspective that you may have. So then I went to the question of why are they dancing? And there was the title Eclipse Dance, but I found that when I searched on that title, I got a lot of results for ghost dance, which was actually something different. So I did eventually find this image on the Library of Congress website, which is also taken by Edward Curtis, a different photograph by the same photographer. And there's a lot of similarities. If you scroll down on this web page, you also find a short description of what the eclipse dance was about. So that helped me to put together what it was that I was looking at and why it was called the eclipse dance. So I also found a website from the Indigenous Peoples Biocultural Climate Change Initiative. And what I found interesting in this website and interesting to share with students was a, a conglomeration of past journalistic articles. So this was one from the Denver Post and it was contemporary in 2017. And it focused on Native American perspectives about solar eclipses. So I also liked how it told from the point of view of a Native American, how they would perceive a solar eclipse. This article, because it was the Denver Post, focused on Navajo tribe, um, but it gave another way of looking at the idea of an eclipse. So then going back, and you can stop there, or you could continue to dig deeper. So I thought about, well, what if we were to map where the Kwakiutl were from? I'm vaguely familiar with the map and outline of British Columbia, but I'm not so familiar about the, the specific boundaries of Vancouver Island. So I searched some more and found that another museum, the Milwaukee Public Museum, happens to have a lot of holdings of Kwakiutl 
material and therefore has a rich website with material about the Kwakiutl, including this map. It's helpful to juxtapose this map with a broader map of North America so that you can find where this is zooming in on in British Columbia, but it helps to give a sense of where they lived. I also found on the Museum, Milwaukee Public Museum website that there are links to several videos that they've put together that are short five minute videos that tell share basic information about the Kwakiutl's culture and traditions. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Darcy to look at our third lens, the making process. All right, so this lens focuses on researching process, materials, and techniques to learn more about the work of art. So by digging deeper about the making process, we can learn <clears throat> the story about the people, places, and experiences that surround the creation of this object. Um, this bed is in the Getty Museum's collection of decorative arts. When I looked up the records on our website about who owned it first, it originally belonged to a French general of Napoleonic Wars. So we're going to let the materials of this bed drive our research process this time. And again, here's a list of questions to consider for this lens. Not only can we research what an object is made of, but we can also consider where the materials came from or who helped make the object, how the materials were obtained and who designed it. And maybe even perhaps figure out how expensive it was to make or how much work it took to get it made. So the first step is again, spend time looking at the work of art like we've done before and write out a list of materials that you see. So I see fabric, I see feathers on the bedpost, I see a gold bed frame, this long stuffed pillow with tassels, I see golden leaves on the top of the bed and fringe on the curtains. So Next, you know, we could chart a more precise list. So by looking at the object label, um, I was able to find out what each of those elements that I had listed was actually made from. And there was some vocabulary that I wasn't too sure about. So after I charted the list of materials, I again highlighted the words to look up. And, uh, you know, by defining the words, I found out that gilded means covered or tinged with gold. Then I want to find out, you know, if we wanted to find out where the materials came from, maybe how they traveled and challenges with obtaining them, we could look through those online sources that we've sort of shared already. And I found out some basic things about the materials and where they came from. So I found that walnut was grown in Grenoble in southeastern France at the time. Um, I found out that ostrich feathers were sourced from Africa using trade routes as far as south, uh, as far away as South Africa. Um, I also learned that the silk was woven by workers using a jacquard loom in France at the time. So while I don't know exactly where the, these exact materials on this exact bed came from, and actually I think these are modern sheets to mimic what the original ones looked like, I can use this exercise to gain a broader perspective about how beds like this were put together in France during this time. Uh, so I could dig deeper into, you know, now that we've looked at the, the materials, maybe I want to look more at how these materials were transformed. Um, so, you know, we can look at where they came from, but we can also look for information about how the materials were transformed. So I used Britannica to see what a jacquard loom was and what it looked like. Um, and then the Getty YouTube channel also has a video showing the gilding process and how that is all done. And so to me, it was interesting to see how raw materials are manipulated using human hands 
technology and techniques pass down over time. And then, you know, there are other options when we're looking at the making process. Um, other options that might be fun to research are, uh, we have a great manuscripts collection that includes pages of books from all around the world. So one example is this depiction of an eyewitness account of the Spanish conquest of Peru. You'll see that on the left. Um, and this other image is from a book much earlier, hundreds of years earlier, um, depending on your students, you may want to choose something, you know, like lions um, that might be more interesting to them. And then some great resources to accompany manuscripts and we, you know, we have sort of a how they are made series of videos on YouTube and the Getty and in Getty blogs, we have some articles, you know, that explore the global uh, you know, how manuscripts across cultures over the span of time during the Middle Ages told different stories. And I thought that was really interesting. And then another option is you could try this oval basin made of clay. Um, you know, another making process is, you know, seeing how earthenware is created. Um, and so that might be really interesting to look at too. I'm sure there are many sources out there to explore that and um, a lot of different uh, types of tools and techniques are used that might be really interesting for your students. So um, that is, you know, one example of a work of art where I explored the making process. And so now I'm going to pass it back over to Rebecca. Okay, so the last lens that we're going to look at today for researching a work of art is a documentary lens. So for this one, we're thinking about the work of art as a source of documentary information. It could be a historical event. It could be a famous person. In this case, we're gonna look at it as a documentation, documentary of some scientific knowledge from the time. So this was an image by a naturalist and illustrator, Maria Sivilla Marion. And she spent most of her life studying creatures and documenting what she learned through her drawings and publishing them in books as well. And this is a drawing that was published in one of her well-known books called the Caterpillar Book, um, which is a, a conglomeration of several hundred drawings showing different um, types of mostly caterpillars, different species, and different details about their life process, their life cycle, showing the specific plants that they lived on, that they liked to eat. Um, so in terms of looking at this from a documentary lens, some of the things that you can consider are what does the image, what does the image have as clues to tell you about the subject? How does it connect with topics that you're already familiar with? So for many California students, for example, they may have studied metamorphosis in second grade, so they'll be being able to scaffold on that learning that they've already done. Um, how would you describe what's happening in the image? What more can you learn about this topic? And what might be missing from this image? And some of you may have already noticed something that might be missing, but we'll be delving into that a little bit more. So step one for figuring out what is this image all about is to inventory the visual details. So there's a very noticeable large green caterpillar. Then there's some things at the bottom that take a little bit more thinking and looking. Um, the item on the left, you can see in the drawing, there are these kind of fiber-like lines, which are the silk of a cocoon. There's a more shiny looking pupa. I spent some time wondering about the, bot, the, the detail on the bottom right that looks very fuzzy and realized that it's a small caterpillar 
maybe the caterpillar when it, it's young before it becomes this full grown green caterpillar. And obviously there's the large moth with the purplish maroonish wings and a plant. So then let's look more into, well, what are these things? So in this case, the object information that comes with the image on, on the website where you find it, either on the Getty website or on the website that contains the Caterpillar book, um, tells us the species that we're looking at. So this is the small emperor moth and each um, detail of the creature in its life cycle are what the small emperor moth would look like in its different stages of metamorphosis. And the damson plum is refers to the plant that it's on, which was one of the, the plants that it frequently liked to eat. Additionally, you can find the artist's name and look more deeply into who was this woman. So the other thing you can do is you can compare the drawing of the small emperor moth with photographs that are contemporary and see what details did the artist, the illustrator in this case, case capture that are consistent with the contemporary photographs. What is different? What might she have missed? Or what might have been different in the creature she was looking at? You could also build on student learning of the life cycle of a moth by using this image to diagram. And when I started diagramming this image, that's when I noticed that there was a critical missing element, which was the egg. So I marked that this image doesn't seem to show the, the egg part of the metamorphosis. I also spent some time looking more into the history of Marion's work and found this website from a past exhibition at the Getty Museum that tells a little bit about her predecessors in the who were naturalists, who were documenting through illustration what they were learning about the natural world, um, and also about Marion's history traveling to Suriname and learning more about a, you know, good several hundred different types of creatures and then culminating her work through publishing her drawings and her observations. Here's uh, the actual Caterpillar book, which can be found in this interactive website in the internet archive. And you can actually flip through it, which is a really fun thing to do. If you look really closely at the page that I opened it to when I took the screenshot, you might find an image that looks similar to the one that we're looking at. Um, you can also download this as a PDF, the entire book, and then you're able to zoom very closely into the illustrations and find several different drawings of different types of butterflies and moths and caterpillars. It would be fun also to look at different creatures and compare. How does the baby caterpillar look relative to the bigger caterpillar? Is it the same across species? Is it different across species? to ask questions about the different types of plants that they might eat. So you can also take this approach um, of a documentary lens to looking at other works of art. So I pulled this example for those of you who are covering in your social studies classrooms, the westward expansion in the United States and learning about um, the different wagon trains and pathways and railroads that were being used to travel to the west. I mean, here's a path, uh, a photograph that captures a donkey train in Colorado and gives a lot of good information as you look into it about how treacherous the roads were and the challenges of that travel. Here's another image. It's a tapestry um, that looks at the relationship between um, Jesuit missionaries who were traveling to China and sharing information and learning about astronomy. And this tapestry, the drawing for this tapestry was based on um, um, accounts that were written by the missionaries of their travels, meeting the Chinese emperor and talking with his advisors about their learning about the stars. 
Okay, so you probably noticed we didn't talk much about what to do after you've done all this research. And we found that you could take a mix and match approach to how you culminate research in your class. And it might be something that's a very involved large project, or it might be something that you do very quickly for just a short, short part of your day. Um, so Darcy's going to go ahead and talk a little bit about some of those ways of culminating the work that you're doing researching works of art. Awesome. All right. So um, I'm just going to go right into it. Uh, so, you know, we've been spending some time together looking at art together, exploring, researching. Um, hopefully you've learned some things about these works of art that you didn't previously know. Um, and so, you know, there are several ways that students can document their research or, you know, have a culminating project. So one idea is to make a, pro a podcast narrating what you learned. So for example, um, students could create a how it's made episode about the French bed that we looked at earlier. Or another idea is to use maps and geography to document findings. So maybe students map where materials came from, like where the ostrich feathers for that bed came from. Or maybe they map the journey of the artist. So maybe they find out where Marion traveled to draw all of those observations of nature and, and where the inspiration for those illustrations came from. And so that might be a fun way to bring in geography. Um, or they could simply map the place or places depicted in an image as Rebecca did with the eclipse dance uh, image that she shared. Um, and then, you know, writing your reflections uh, is sort of a go to, um, but, you know, we could really ask students to write down, you know, what were they curious about? What did they learn about the artist or did anything surprise them? So maybe they had some personal feelings about the experience of Miss Lala like I did, or um, maybe they have a personal reflection about, you know, what it would be like to lay in that that French bed. Um, and then students could also make a slideshow or any other type of presentation to present their research. Um, and then another idea is you could utilize small group work and create a wall size collage of the whole class's findings. So you could have students um, keep images or, or words or, you know, basically artifacts from the research project and you could sort of sort a wall size, have a, a wall size scrapbook if, if that's something that you think your students would enjoy. And you know there's so many ideas out there and I'm sure that you all have others. And then here's a list of some of the sources we used. Um, and I know like depending, Rebecca mentioned this earlier, but depending on the limitations of technology, firewalls, all that stuff, um, or, you know, what your students are allowed to do. Um, you probably have your own sources that you go to, um, but these were ones that we thought were pretty good for researching art. Um, and so uh, I'm going to pass it back over to Rebecca, and she is going to conclude our presentation. Okay, so just wrapping up um, uh, and reviewing um, the trajectory of this year's, oops, this year's webinar series. Um, we started with how to read an image. We went on to talk about how to talk about art. Today, we've been taking time, some time to think about how to go about researching a work of art with your students. Um, and we hope that these are all things that you and your students can put together to really enhance your ability to understand images, enjoy looking and learning about works of art. The last step, which we plan to cover in our March and April webinars, is how to take these skills that students have built looking at works of art, talking about them, thinking about them, researching them, and apply them to their own creative process. So we hope that you'll come back in March and April 
Um, March is for grades K through five and April is for grades six through 12. Um, to explore with us some ways that you can guide your students to use their visual literacy skills for self-expression. We also wanna highlight that these approaches work really well with a whole diversity of images and types of art. So we, while we've presented mostly Western works of art, we hope that you'll go to other muse museums' websites that feature different types of works of art and use these same approaches there as well. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this webinar. And we will look forward to seeing you again in the future, hopefully. And we wish you all a wonderful evening.